took her panties and her bra off. And, uh, I had sexual intercourse. Well, after that, I cut her up in little teeny pieces. In 1983, a penniless drifter named Henry Lee Lucas was arrested in Stoneburg, Texas, on suspicion of murdering an 80-year-old widow. What Lucas had to say shocked investigators. Not only did he confess to the murder of the old woman, he also claimed he'd killed 60 other people. It was the beginning of a confession spree that would make Lucas the most notorious killer in America. It's like being a movie star. You're just playing the part, you know. You don't think of it, you just play it. Make out that you're the worst serial killer in the history of the United States. And that's what I did. I was at home one Saturday morning back in uh, June of uh, 1983. I had a call from the uh, sheriff in Montague County. He called me and said, uh, Jim, uh, I've got an old boy in jail up here that you might want to talk to. He has uh, confessed to uh, killing two people uh, close to here and uh, has also said that he's killed a, a lot of other people uh, all over the country. Stunned by Lucas's dramatic revelations, Sheriff Botwell called in the Texas Rangers, one of America's oldest and proudest police forces. A special task force was formed to coordinate nationwide investigations into the killings. Texas Ranger Bob Prince was assigned to head the new force. We were absolutely deluged. The first day that we opened the task force doors, uh, we had 70 uh, uh, telephone calls, long distance telephone calls to return. And uh, when we started returning them, we were receiving calls all the time. And we began booking interviews with agencies to come and interview Lucas. I walked across the courthouse and I told the judge I'd committed these 60 murders, you know. And when I did, it seemed like the house fell in. Because I never seen as many helicopters and, and reporters and cars and police cars and things that started to come in there. A videotaped confession by admitted killer Henry Lee Lucas. Could Henry Lee Lucas, who claims to have killed over 150 women, was brought into an area in an undisclosed location. Have confirmed his involvement in more than 200 murders in 26. We show him uh, he cleared a murder of a white female in Norfolk, Virginia, on the night of September. Lucas took phone calls from policemen all over the country. Under the stewardship of the Texas Rangers, he provided details of the hundreds of murders he claimed to have committed. Task force investigators began compiling a log which gave the locations of the murders being attributed to Lucas. Piece by piece, the task force built up a picture of Lucas's life on the road roaming the interstates in search of a place to call home. For more than eight years, Lucas drifted from town to town, going nowhere and achieving nothing. Except, perhaps, hundreds of murders. I gave him a number, which uh, I gave him a long time ago, that it was 150, and nobody didn't believe it. And after I passed 150, people began to wonder. And I told him it's going to be way over 360. In tape-recorded confessions, Lucas provided gruesome details of his eight-year orgy of killing. I've killed by strangulation, I've killed by knifing, I've killed by hit and runs, shootings, uh, robberies, uh, hangings, uh, every, every type of crime I've done it. Every case I would go out on, or 
for them, you know. They would automatically pick up the telephone and call the news media, tell them that I'd solved four or five cases that day. So the news media would come running, you know. How do you feel? Like I did today. Like what? Same as I did today. What do you predict tomorrow? It was interview after interview. I mean, I couldn't turn around unless it was an interview. And I started staying on TV 24 hours a day. I mean, it changed me. And I got so that I thought I was the biggest movie star in this country. Real nice smile you got there. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Lucas did become a movie star. The cult film, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, was a fictionalized account of his life. Elvis Presley was supposed to be the biggest shot, but I think I even beat Elvis Presley. And I think I even beat, uh, what's his name, Adolf Hitler? Seemed like I was going to beat him. Because it seemed like every time they would bring a murder case in, I would accept it no matter what it was. The Henry Lee Lucas Roadshow was in full swing. And Lucas, who had lived all his life as a bum, was basking in his new career as a serial killer. I was a king. I had everything I wanted, everything possible that, that a man could want, I had. I had money I didn't have before. I had a colored television I didn't have before. I had cable TV, and I didn't have that before. I had all kinds of food, even stacks of cigarettes and cartons in my house. That's coming from nothing. The relationship between Lucas and his task force supervisors was becoming increasingly intimate. I was real close to Sheriff Bowell. We were like father and son. Me and Prince were like brothers, you know. We'd go places, we'd do things, we'd do, I mean, anything, anytime. No matter what time it was, day or night. For Prince and Botwell, the hard work was bringing dividends. They were making a name for themselves as the lawmen responsible for clearing up more than 200 unsolved murders. But their credibility was about to be called into question. 18-year-old Deborah Sue Williamson had been murdered back in August 1975. She'd been married only a few months. In one of his confessions, Lucas claimed he had broken into her home and stabbed her several times. When Deborah's parents, Joyce and Bob Lemons, learned that their daughter's murder had been solved, they thought their ordeal was over. We had a call from a detective in Lubbock, um, told us that uh, the case had been solved, uh, that Henry Lucas had done the crime, and um, uh, we said, okay, we'll be there uh, Monday morning to see what you have. When the Lemons got to hear Lucas's tape-recorded confession, they were astonished. I think we both sort of simultaneously realized this is a joke, you know. He knew that she was <clears throat> stabbed. He knew that part. But everything else was totally wrong. Uh, everything. In his confession, Lucas said he remembered the white house where he'd killed the girl. But at the time of the murder, the house was green. Lucas claimed he'd broken in through the patio door to murder Deborah. At the time, the door was sealed shut. Finally, Lucas said he'd killed the girl in her bedroom. In fact, Deborah was murdered outside the house. The Lemons were convinced that Deborah's murderer was still free. They began their own investigation, talking to Lucas's relatives. They discovered that on the day Deborah was murdered in Lubbock, Texas, Lucas was with his half-sister in Maryland, nearly 2,000 miles away. 
I mean, let's face it. Uh, even Jesus Christ couldn't be in two places at one time. Uh, and Henry is certainly no Jesus Christ. The Lemons visited Task Force headquarters. They told Jim Botwell and Bob Prince they'd got the wrong man. We went, you know, pleading with them to just listen to this, just hear this. Um, they were not receptive to that at all. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, Bob Prince gave me the alternative uh, of either leave on your own power uh, or we'll throw you out. What did you think of their investigation? Uh, of the lemons? Oh, I have no comment about the lemons. You know, they're... Well, they've invested years of their life looking into the Lucas case. I have no interest in that. In Waco, Texas, District Attorney Vic Fazell was also having doubts about the Lucas confessions. He was preparing to prosecute three murder cases for which Lucas had already claimed responsibility. But the deeper Fazell got into the case, the more worried he became by the lack of any corroborating evidence. All there are is confessions. That means just Henry's word that he killed these people. No fingerprints. No hair samples, no eyewitnesses, no blood samples, no forensic evidence at all. Uh, I don't know if in England you know who Freddy Krueger is, a uh, nightmare on, El on Elm Street. I'm telling you, Freddy Krueger couldn't have committed these murders without leaving some kind of clue. Fazell and his investigators pieced together documentary evidence from Lucas's former life as a drifter. Paychecks, work records, applications for food stamps, traffic violations. But much of the evidence they unearthed conflicted with the task force log. In case after case, Fazell's investigators put Lucas in other parts of the country on the days the murders were committed. On two occasions, he was actually in prison. You cannot be in jail in Maryland and be committing a murder in California at the same time. You cannot be getting a traffic ticket in Florida and committing a murder in Texas at the same time. When we started finding this information, suddenly in our office, uh, we gave Henry the nickname of Rocket Man because he had, had to have had a rocket to get around the U.S. To, to commit these kinds of murders like he was doing. There's just no way that it was physically possible. Task Force records had Lucas killing Estella Montoya in Corpus Christi, Texas on March the 5th, 1981. But on the same day, Lucas was 1,200 miles away selling scrap metal in Florida. Do you think it's feasible that he could have been 1,200 miles away in Jacksonville and killed in Corpus Christi, Texas on the same day? No, sir. No. No, I do not. So how do you explain the discrepancy? Uh, I can't explain that one. There are many other discrepancies. Lucas was supposed to have strangled Cora Carrillo in Douglas County, Nevada. In fact, he was more than 2,000 miles away in Jacksonville, Florida, buying insurance for his car. Diana Underwood was supposedly shot by Lucas in Baytown, Texas. But Lucas was 750 miles away in Florida selling scrap metal. Hermine Dufour was murdered in Louisiana, but on the day she was killed, Lucas was in jail in Texas. Why do you think that Lucas confessed to the murder of Hermine Dufour in Louisiana when he was in fact in jail in Texas on the day she was killed? Oh, uh, I have no idea as to why, because like I say, I don't recall the name Hermine before. I, uh, I, I just don't know. During 1979, Lucas cashed 43 weekly paychecks at the Byright grocery store in Jacksonville, Florida. 
But in the same period, the task force log has Lucas killing on 46 occasions in 16 different states. Could Lucas have managed all these murders and still have made it back to Jacksonville in Florida at the end of every week to cash his paycheck? Does it make sense? Well, certainly that, that would make sense if he's the one actually cashing the paychecks. Uh, let's look at each individual case. But from your experience as an investigator, does that seem likely that someone would go on this tour of the United States and every week wind up back in Jacksonville, Florida? Let's look at each individual case and let the individual agency determine was he there or was he at the work site or was he at a... Was he cashed the check? Captain Prince, excuse not me. Not the task force. I'm not making a point about yeah. the individual cases. I'm I, I know what you're doing. I'm making the, the amount of travel that Lucas is supposed to have done during this period. We're, we're getting nowhere. Do you think that it's we're getting nowhere. credible that he could have traveled that much and, and committed that many murders? We're, we're getting nowhere. I'm through. There are, I'm sorry, but there just are a whole and our office is closed. series of, as soon as you of get points the, about the travel that your, Lucas was supposed to have made. As soon as you get your... That I, we I was get hoping we could discuss. Our office is closed. Okay. And I was really hoping this would be an objective interview, but uh, I can say it's not. The Rangers' case was being destroyed by their rival, Vic Fazell. Okay, whenever you can get your stuff out, we'll... Fazell and his team visited Lucas in jail to present him with their evidence. They sat in the room and talked to me. They said, now we know you didn't do these cases. So look at this. And they had a great big uh, double page uh, newspaper, I think. I'm not sure of that. But every place I had been, every case that I had confessed to, and where I was at, what time the crime happened and what time I was here. They had that laid out there on the desk. And now we know you didn't do it. When confronted with this information, he looked at us, he smiled. He said, I was wondering when somebody was going to get wise to this. Lucas began to recant. But if Lucas's confessions were all phony, how had he conned so many investigators for so long? Lucas had shown a remarkably detailed knowledge of the murders. Details it was thought only the killer could have known. When she started to run, well, I grabbed her. And I put a twenty-two on her. I told her, I said, now you do what I want or I'm going to shoot you. But before investigating officers could interrogate Lucas, they had to send in their murder reports to the task force. I believe the Rangers in particular Prince and Boutwell were purposefully tutoring and coaching Henry on what to say, uh, letting him read these uh, offense reports that contained all the facts. I didn't go to them and say, now look, i got a murder case down the road here. You know, let me tell you about it. It didn't happen that way. <coughs> they would bring it to me and tell me about it. Well, that's an outright lie. Uh, as I said earlier, the task force was set up to make him available to uh, other officers. Uh, we did not feed him information. Vic Fazell's allegation of task force misconduct brought him into direct conflict with the force's heads, Jim Botwell and Bob Prince. Only days after speaking out publicly, Fazell became the target of an FBI corruption investigation. He believes the Rangers were behind it. As a result of what I said about the task force, about Prince and Boutwell, they got together with their friends in the state police uh, who had ties, strong ties with the FBI, and they started an investigation of me. My house was searched. I was accused of burglaries. I was accused of homicides. I was accused of bribery. I was accused of being a racketeer. I was investigated for everything. I was handcuffed and dragged through the streets in public view in front of the TV cameras and everything else. But my four-year-old son sitting at home seeing it all on TV as it happened. 
said all along, I'll still be proven right. Fazell went to trial facing 80 years in jail. He defended himself against the charges and was acquitted. He went on to sue the Dallas TV station which had repeated the Ranger FBI allegations. In that case, the jury were convinced that the Rangers had set out to frame Vic Fazell. They awarded him $58 million, the largest libel payment in American history. All this happened because I spoke out against the Texas Rangers. I stepped on the wrong toes. They didn't like it. With Fazell's victory, the credibility of the task force was finally destroyed. But before he recanted his confessions, Lucas had been convicted on ten counts of murder. He's on death row, awaiting his appeal. Vic Fazell is now his attorney. Henry just may be put to death still, in spite of the evidence, in spite of there being no physical evidence, no witnesses, nothing to tie Henry to these crimes except what came out of his own mouth, which was fed to him that he just regurgitated back out. Henry will probably be put to death for something he didn't do. If my appeal is denied, I won't stand a chance of staying alive. This is Texas. And whatever happens in Texas, no matter what it is, they're going to have their way. And I'm trying to fight a legend. You know that, don't you? The Texas Rangers is a legend. Without his confessions, there's no convincing evidence that Henry Lucas committed a single murder. If that's true, hundreds of killers are today walking free. And the legacy of Lucas's gigantic hoax is a trail of suffering. You lie to the police. You lie to the families. You've done nothing but lie. It ain't worth it. I've, uh, I know that a lot of people, unless they put their self in the, uh, type life I lived, wouldn't understand. Do you feel ashamed of what you've done? I do.